It's a grand old flag, it's a high-flying flag, it's the emblem for me and for you. G'day everybody, it's Peps again and right now this is the one that I've been looking forward to. It's the 2022 Melbourne Football Club season preview. Now, in true Melbourne fashion, I did not get someone from Turak. I did not get someone from Elwood. I've reached all the way across to Hong Kong to bring in Peter Molan host of the D's Watch podcast to have a chat about the Melbourne Demons. And Peter, I have simply one question for you. Will it be back to back for the D's or will we be pitchforked into failure? Peter, welcome to Lace Out. Jeez, <sighs> firstly, thanks very much for having me, Peps. I really appreciate coming on. I'm getting another chance to talk about the D's on top of the, the weekly podcast the D watch that I have with my mates, um, man, you, you start with the you start with the big question, and, and what the the optimist in me, the the demon supporter from 2021, says, absolutely, we are we are geared up for we are geared up for back to back. We are perfectly placed. However, this is not my my second year of supporting the demons. <laughs> I've um, I've got ridden the the ups and the downs and, and the waves, bouncing around like a tennis ball my my entire life. So. The demon supporter in me says, well, maybe we're due for a down year. Um, no, we're not due for a down year. We've had too many of those. We had 57 of those. Uh, look, I'm, I'm going to, obviously we're going to be interviewing and we're going to be doing this, but I'm going to add my two cents in because this is the only chance I get to talk about my team in a little bit more than I do on, on the normal ones as well too. Yeah. My biggest concern is I don't know how to handle myself at the moment. I want to take the lid off but I have to leave the lid on because it is Melbourne. Have you, but have that's you done? Ooh, I think, I think, I think the crop that we've got from a coaching perspective, from a culture perspective, a player perspective seems so much different than what we've had. For, for a, I would almost go as far back to the 87 when we did it for Robbie. That's mm. as far back as I think that there's this tightness at the moment. It just, it just seems impenetrable. I think even just look at the age profile of the list as well. And I, I know a lot of clubs jump early on that. They jump early into talking about the age demographic and, and you know, I'm not going to say dynasty, but look, I accidentally just did. But the something I've always found just absolutely amazing is that no premiership team has ever played together again in even, not even a final premiership, but just in a home and away game. They've never taken the field together again. And sort of thinking through like, why is that? And, well, I'm thinking, well, because so many teams have this this spread, um, this this spread of ages, and then at the end of the season, someone reaches their their lifetime goal of winning a premiership, and they retire, or one of the big players gets offered a big contract and they leave the club. It it hasn't happened with the D's, and I, I honestly think that the only thing that's stopping us from from having, I suppose, breaking that drought of premiership teams playing together is is injury. And I know that that could be said for other clubs as well, but we've lost nothing over the, over the preseason and looking at the, our elder players, um, probably Hibbert and Gorn being the two oldest on the list. I don't see an immediate drop off in either of them. Certainly not in Max Gorn and Hibbert no, seems like really sort of put together a very, very solid season. So he'd be going into, uh, I suppose the upcoming round one as probably an expected 22 player. Definitely. It was almost like he got a bit of rejuvenation towards yeah. the end of the year. I don't know if that was just an emotional high from everybody, but you know, you have a look at who left the club in terms of delisted, et cetera. But it was mm. Nathan Jones went and you can yeah. understand why. He he was he, he he was done. Like no matter and I hear people go, should we have played him on grand final day? Well, if you in you know, hindsight, you would, because Jordan didn't get on the park. But who's to say May didn't go twang in the first two minutes of the game? You have to bring Jordan on. On that big ground over there in Perth, mm. Joe's would have almost been a bit of a liability. So that's the way that you look at it. Neville Jetta totally turned his career around once Ruse got there. Like he was almost out the door and he said, no, let's just try you down back and see how that works. Magnificent. But then you have a look at the other names. Austin Bragg, he didn't do anything. Kyle Dyke, didn't do anything. Marty Hall, he was good for for – when he was around and, and has never 
I'm surprised he's not picked up somewhere else. Yeah. Um, you've also got Jay Lockhart, who they delisted. Aaron Nitschke just didn't have any luck with his knees. And yeah. another bloke, Vandenberg, who, you know, if you go back to that 2018 series, I really liked his game against Hawthorne that night. Mm. It, it just, you know, it, we had plenty of people to replace him. So we haven't really lost anyone that you look at and go, oh, gee, that's going to leave a massive dint. Yeah, and the leadership team remains intact. We haven't lost any any veteran players who may have been the level heads or, or anything like that that you'll often see premiership teams lose or a peripheral player, again, in the past, even going back to you know, re- fairly recent years, um, you see premiership teams, they, they get chipped away at. They're, they're peripheral players. They, they get enticed out of the team. We, we didn't lose someone like Spargo or, or Neil Bullen or someone like that who... In the past, Gold Coast might have come knocking or, or, or another rebuilding team, North Melbourne, might have come knocking. It, it didn't happen to us. I, I suppose we avoided that for this year. So I, I'm quite confident in the list going into the year. And it did, but it did come knocking because Sam Wiedemann was offered out and he yep. said, no, I want to stay. So that hey, means says, but that, yep. that says to me, that's a guy that says, I know my place. I want to be part of this. Kate he could have Chandler taken the got, a, have, got an offer from Adelaide as well, and he he not I he got in I think for two games last year. Kay Chandler he he played in the in the practice match recently. I, I, I think good, Goody loves he? him. Goody absolutely oh, loves him. But I mean, he got an offer. He he'd be getting games. He'd be getting games at Adelaide this year. There's absolutely no guarantee for Chandler or Wiedemann to be getting games. It, and, it's exciting. Like we, you know, you look at the list, and, and even like the blokes they brought in this year. So. From a drafting perspective, et cetera, you've got Taj Y. Woden, who apparently got better and better as the season went on. Like, he's a 183, 78 kick. He's probably going to be like his dad, but a little bit taller. Blake Howells, who they brought in, like, he slipped all the way down that, to yeah. a position that Melbourne was sitting there going, I don't know how we got him. You get, okay, so let's just put this in perspective. Um, you've got Ben Brown. You've got Wiedemann. You've got uh, Tomlinson. You've got um, Lever, and you've got May. Why don't we just bring in the best swingman we could possibly offer up in the draft in Jacob Van Ruin? So if we yeah. need to throw him down back, we've got something. He's got clunking hands as a forward. So as these older veterans and in the forward line get, you potentially might have something like a Jackson Van Ruin combination down. That blows your mind. You've got mm. Judd McVie, who apparently goes all right. You've got Andy uh, Moniz Wakefield, who is seems to be lighting up the list from a, a – a reports perspective, and they've got this guy called Daniel Turner who they've picked up on a rookie list yeah. who seems to have just opened people's eyes up during match simulations, et cetera, to be able to force his way in to the group as part of this um, uh, practice match rounds that they're having, the one against Carlton. So like, that is amazing. And to think that there's people like, you know, tomorrow night when, or when we play this game, and this game will, you know, this will be going to air after it, but. Mm. Rivers isn't playing, Salem isn't playing, May isn't playing, which is a good core of your back line, and they're just able to slot people straight in. Hunt yeah. goes in. Tomlinson goes back in. Smith goes back. It's just awesome to see that, you know, when we had depth when Dean Turlick was winning our best uh, coming second in the BNF, that's just how deep we were. Now you're just like, now you can pick up Luke Dunstan and have mm. him as just a backup just in case anything happens. That that's that's exciting. That's and exciting. When you lose when you lose a player like Aaron Vandenberg, who I think was a great player for the club, but then you get a big bodied midfielder like Luke Dunstan coming in, who yep. picked up eleven Brownlow votes from twelve games at St Kilda last year. Um, while we did lose Vandenberg, and I, I love Vandenberg, I'm a, I'm a huge rap for him, and I, I think he really did change the tone of the team when he came in. I think his first game back uh, in 2018 was against West Coast, and he was just breaking ribs. Uh, he, he, and he stood up for the for the younger players around him. It, I suppose the game more or less passed him by. But if, if we're trading a life for life and losing someone like Nathan Jones, who got games in 2021, we're losing Vandenberg, who got games in 2021, and replacing him with a player like Luke Dunstan, then look, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. But I think something that me and uh, we were talking about on the, on the D-Watch this week was this idea that, in years gone by, when Melbourne was at its worst, the, the amount of pressure that we put on draftees coming in. So when everyone yes. was talking about their best 22s coming in, you'd have about four, maybe five spots filled by these 18-year-old kids who had just walked through the door. And then you sent them out against Hawthorne in round one. 
And oh. like it was exciting at the time in the preseason, and you're saying, you know, you know, you know, get them in there, get them in the team, get games into them. But looking at, I suppose, the mindset then, and and what those players had to face compared to this, where I, I don't, it would probably take a pretty brave tipster to predict any of our draftees from this year going into the Melbourne Best Twenty Two for round one. And how good is that? Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. Two seasons ago, we had our holy trinity of Jackson, Pickett, Rivers come in. And yep. that almost was the, uh, the energy injection that we needed. And they, they've grown substantially. And, you, you know, if you say who's the best player out of it, well, Jackson gets the, Jackson gets the, the Lord. It's, you know, he's going to get the mega offer from Fremantle, et cetera. Mm. Pickett just crunches and loves nothing more but can pick, pick goals. But then you've got this young guy, Rivers, who just steps into the back line, doesn't look a pl- – He's, he, there's players that they say, oh, he's going to be a 200 gamer. He's a 200 gamer, potentially future captain, just the way that he yeah. handles it. He's no frills. And I think he was captain of the WA team when he was over there. So he's got the pedigree of leadership behind him. You can sit back and you can look at people like we just mentioned. Why well, Woden doesn't need to play a game. Uh, Van Ruin doesn't need to play a game. You don't need to rush them in. We don't need to do a Jack Watts Queen's birthday again just to pull people through the door. Because we've got a midfield that is, oh, where can we start with that? You've got a back line that everybody is trying to mould their back line into and mm. you've got a forward line that has how many options to it? How many strings to that bow have you got? You know, and it's, the it's weakness, interesting. There's two weaknesses. It's either up here in the head or it's going to be a physical injury that's going to stop yeah. us. That's the way that I look at it. They're just strong across every line. And this is, there's also this unspoken thing, and it's interesting that something that I've been thinking about recently is I think when we look back at Melbourne's 2021 season, we, we think of it being dominant, and I think it was people's lasting memory of that is that it was this dominant season because of our finals campaign mm-hmm. where we crushed anyone who, who came up against us. I suppose the interesting thing, though, is to take a little step back for that and consider when the siren went at the end of the match against Geelong in round 23, we were third on the ladder. We, we, we weren't... We, as, as good as the season was, we did have a patch towards the end of the season, which our connection wasn't there. Things, things weren't going the way that they should have. We can, we can put that down to mindset. We can put that, I'm not sure what they were doing with training loads at the time. The, the crowds had gone from the MCG. We sometimes played our best football, uh, for example, against Port Adelaide over at, um, over at Adelaide Oval, and then came back to an empty MCG the next week and lost to Hawthorne. But I think something that we can sort of look at is there's there's so much unspoken complication or something you can never put your finger on about a football club as to why they play well. And again, if you look pound for pound, we we have an, an excellent team that's strong along every line. So if we're if we're looking forward to the season that comes, I don't see where our failings come from. It's a really strong list if we can stay together. But at the same time, as well as playing some absolutely exhilarating football. In 2021, we're also capable of some pretty average football as well, um, and I suppose that's where that's where this idea of mindset and culture in a club and, and your support staff and who's supporting Goodwin and having someone like Mark Williams around the club, having someone like Adam Uze around the club, and how absolutely essential they are to to keep the players on track um, and and focused on the ta- task at hand, and then just leadership from the playing group, which. Aside from losing Nathan Jones at the end of last year, I think you know, I, I'm confident in Max Gorn uh, and I'm, I'm confident in, in the people that we have in place to, to keep the players on track. And oh, they're, they're looking pretty solid, actually, because, you know, yeah. Where do you want to start? So uh, they've, they've had their premiership. Okay, you celebrate. I get it. The track has come back, what, two weeks, uh, 10 days after a, a- a, a grand final yeah. and starts training again. They come back after Christmas. Twelve to thirteen players have set PBs for the time trial. There's a hunger there because you've got to remember there's a core bunch of players that didn't play in that flag, and we're not talking about average types. We're talking a bit along the names of you know, Jake Melksham. At one stage, was a gun for that 2018 mm. season, which got us in that final series. He, he was extraordinary. What he's he was unbelievable about. that year. Yeah. Tomlinson, he's gone down against his – he was a lock for the entire season. Yep. Does his knee against North. Petty walks in. Bang. Um, Jaden Hunt played, I think, 20, 
22 games last year, but be 22 or 20? I'm going to say 21. I think he went out in the, in the third last Second round. last or third. Yeah. Does a, an injury, just can't get back in because there's this young little ginger ninja who comes in and is, looks like he's been playing for five years. He's just yes. hitting targets left, right and centre. You've got Wiedemann who's sitting back going, I should be there, but I haven't been able to get there for whatever. And I will also say, I think not having the BFL for the last couple of seasons yep. has affected him as well too. Because I think it's if you remember at the start of last player, yeah. BFL season, he was ticking along nicely. He was kicking bags yeah. with Brown as well too. Then you've got people, like I said, um, Joel Smith, he was in the team with mm-hmm. a, a couple of weeks to go, gets injured, Ibid gets back in. Um, like Oscar Baker, he's like, okay, this is my last chance, but there is an opportunity. Cole Chandler, you know, I've, I want to be part of this as well. There's so many stories that you look at it and go, there's players that can fit these slots. So that the, the ones who are at the top know that if I don't perform, someone could take it, and it might be the second last week, mm. I potentially may not get back in again. We've never had that before. No. And certainly not. Certainly not in my lifetime. Perhaps we had it in the 60s. I, I wasn't around for that. But I wasn't around for that. In my lifetime, in my lifetime it, yeah, it's, it's an unrecognisable situation. So looking to this year, what, what's the most exciting thing? Is it the back line for you? Is it the midfield or is it your forward line that you just think that this is where we can get better? Because you have think, to get better. You can't stay the same because everybody else is doing the same. And we, we're the hunted this year. Um, exactly. And it's it, everyone would have been looking at everything that we do. And, again, something that we've been doing in, in the D-Watch when we watch matches is we try to, I suppose, objectively look at when teams do well against us and, and what they do. And it is a system that can be broken down if we're not absolutely switched on for the day. Right. Before but, we I go think, further, you've mentioned yeah. it. What, yeah. what are some of the things that you've noticed that could potentially be chinks in the armour? Because you've opened okay. up that door and let's address it now before we forget. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna have to remember all the different examples. It doesn't have to, be, think, doesn't have to yeah. be everything, but they're just a couple of things that Melbourne supporters from last year will go, yep, yeah, yeah. i got a point there. I think one thing, we, one thing we have talked about is the idea that how well we played against the good teams and how poorly we played against the poor teams. And we dropped some absolute sitters over the course of the year. We had the draw against Hawthorne. We had a 50-point win against Hawthorne in the early rounds, but it's also worth noting that we were neck and neck at three-quarter time against Hawthorne. We were neck and neck with North Melbourne for most of the match. We had our first loss of the year against Adelaide, and then we got comprehensively outplayed by Collingwood. Um, yep. At the uh, uh, the Queen's birthday match up at the Queen's SCG. Queen's birthday match at the traditional home yeah. of the SCG. And didn't they love it up there? Um, something that we something that we've noted is that when we come up against the good teams, that they more or less play into our hands. And this sort of comes back to I remember Mick Malthouse in the, in the Collingwood days, sort of around sort of 20, 2010, 2011, He he would always talk about how they would would never play a tagger because they trusted their system. And no matter how the game was going, they would always play their football. Yep. And I think when Melbourne comes up against teams like that, when we have the opportunity to prepare what the other team is going to do to us, if a team doesn't have a really solid plan B, then they're going to play into our hands. And I think because we're a really well-coached team, I think we're a really well, well-drilled team. When, when teams give us what we expect to see, we seem to play really well. And it seems to be the better teams are more stubborn with what they'll do. Whereas when you come up against a young team like Adelaide, they seem to throw everything completely out the window and they attack the corridor with everything they have. And it's low percentage football. Chances are it's not going to come off a lot of times, but they use pace, they use short possession, and they charge up the corridor as quickly as they could um, to try to break up our, our defence. And it, it, and it worked. And we were a little off that day, granted, but credit where credit's due, Adelaide took the game on and won. And I think when you look at the, the Collingwood match, again, it was, it was short chains of possession that was able to take away our strengths, which is marking or spoiling or intercepting down the line. Again, Collingwood, <laughs> it's pretty rare that they're going to have a day where they have that higher disposal efficiency. It was insane, the disposal, disposal efficiency they had. I think Pendle was out of control that day. Like you're looking at it going, I haven't seen. About 90%. But also that was the day that they got rid of Buckley. And then they yeah. were cheering it. And I'm sitting there going, you're celebrating a win 
the same day the coach you're booting out. If you had played like this throughout the year, yeah. he'd still be there. So and there was a bit of emotion attached to it, false emotion a, from their perspective. a similar situation to the, the, the repeat match against, against Hawthorne where, yeah, I think we can all say, thank God um, Hawthorne's finally got rid of Alistair Clarkson. The Clarkson years are done. They can, you know, the dark Clarkson era is, is over. It was a, okay. what an amazing decision that was. Um, but we played them, I think, about 10 days after that. Clarkson brought the ball to the ground at every opportunity. I think we saw it. Uh, uh, there was one part in particular where I think O'Neara had it on, on centre wing in the last quarter and he intentionally just Kicked dropped it along the, the ground. ball along the ground and completely took our tools out of it. And it was, it was a wet, wet, greasy night and they, they took their chances. And the, look, it felt like a loss at the time. It was a draw, but that's how they did. They, they grubbed the ball around. So I think when teams are able to... to Adapt what they will what they will ordinarily do, and it's they almost like a chaos ball energy. going into the back line because yeah, like everybody pushes forward up the ground. Their forwards pushed up the ground. We sat ours back as the quarterback. I'm sorry, centre half back or full back would actually stay right. Yep. But there were teams that just didn't do that. They just kicked the ball down to forward, and it was it was either along the ground or they just booted mm-hmm. it in where you didn't have that opportunity to yep. set up and it turned it into to one on ones. Lever couldn't get back out to help May. Ibid couldn't push across. The halfbacks, even the wingers, Brayshaw and Langdon would push up quite high as well too to almost become a seventh and eighth backman as well. Mm. They didn't have the opportunity to do that as much and that's what caught us out. And I think we were a little bit stubborn because there were games that people were tearing us apart. I think Josh Kelly was tearing us apart in the GWS game. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was at the Collingwood game. I'm pretty sure it might have been Pendlebury or Dugowie was on fire. They both point. had they both yep. had field days that day, yep. Why didn't we go, okay, let's flip it a bit. Our team defence can definitely hold up on 17. Put a tagger on Pendlebury to stop that because if, if they were the catalyst for the, for the rest of the group firing up, stop it at the coalface. And I think sometimes we got a bit stubborn in yeah. this will come back to, you know, and in most cases it did come back, but you've got to have that plan B. And for such a long time, Melbourne didn't have a plan B. Yeah, it was either plan A or lose. That was plan B, lose, and lose by was, usually a lot. It's an interesting thing because I, I, I haven't seen yet, and I, I, I'm not sure if it's come out or I'm not sure if they're sitting on it for now, but I haven't seen great um, behind-the-scenes stuff of the from the Ds last year, as even in the finals. Like I haven't seen too much of what was happening as far as Goodman's pregame and, and halftime address. The, the one thing I have seen is that and in the halftime address, Goodwin finished with referring to the Brisbane game, which I think kind of ties into what you were saying in that Goodwin was saying to them, like, stick at it. And I think we're the, we were the best third quarter team in the league oh, last by year. By a mile. By our, a our mile. Fitness, our fitness was unbelievable. And I think he kept referring throughout the season back to the match against Brisbane where we were outplayed in the first half by just a team that was playing better. And there was, there was not really much more to it than that. They were, they were looking fantastic. They were sharp. They were aggressive. And we stuck to it and it, it turned and it turned fairly swiftly in the third quarter where we saw probably our best, aside from the finals, we saw our best football of the year yep. in the second half against Brisbane. And just to put it in perspective, our percentage for third quarters last year was 167.88. The nearest was 142 and that was Geelong. And we saw what we did to Geelong. Yeah. If you then want to even take it one step further and have a look at halves, you have a look at the second half. Our second halves, we averaged 156. So we almost kicked, oh, doubled it and added another half in the second mm. half. The nearest to that was 20% under, which again was the Brisbane Lions. So you're right. We would go with teams until half time, but we knew that our – Fitness, which wasn't always our best thing, Dave Misson, we're looking at you, would take it to the next level and they would come out in third quarters and do what they did. And in that grand final, it was just a matter of we just needed a break. We were, we were doing everything possible. The Bulldogs threw everything at us. We were only a couple of goals down. And as soon as that, that first one went through and then Fritch kicked the second and then yeah. Brown kicked the third, it was pretty much over from that perspective. You could see it just see it in the Bulldogs' eyes. It was like, <laughs> oh, what just happened? Because we'd even three, two and a half quarters to get to here, 
and they've yeah. been able to eliminate it in a minute. And even, and we know even in that day. game, it, I don't think we were playing badly. Well, we, we, had a, we had a sensational first quarter. Even in the second quarter and for half of the third where, where Bulldogs got a jump on us, I really don't think it was we were doing anything particularly wrong. It's just they, to sort they, of sit back and, and go, thing. man, they these guys played are good footy. They, are. they yeah, played they are. good footy. They, they made were the hot. final for a reason. Hot was hot. Trelaw gets yeah. a couple of, like, I won't say fluky ones. It's the wrong way to yep. put it. But there was a couple that squeezed out, just landed in his lap where he was able to yep. convert. They did everything right. But didn't you see what happened? We don't need to go on about it because we got limited time for this. Yeah. But it was just, it was, a, it was a beautiful thing to watch. And that's the yeah. thing. It was a really good grand final. People need to forget that it was up until three-quarter time, it was a corker of a game because at Absolutely. that stage, are the Bulldogs going to get back? Are Melbourne going to sit back? Oh, I was nervous as hell. I don't know, mm. probably you were as well. Is Melbourne going to fall back into their old routine? Well, I think it's after Sparrow kicked the first one to, to Brown and he goes back and slots his third. I think it was all over from then. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so concerns-wise, if we had a look at the concerns, do you, you reckon the concerns are – just that manic football pressing forward, not at our end, but at their end. Look, I think that's that's my that's my main one. That's where I can see it probably. Happening. Yeah, it's hard to sort of pick a weak spot at them. It is, and I, I think it probably does to to an extent. It comes down to injuries as well. I think we we yeah. weren't without injuries in twenty twenty one, but we did also have a pretty good run. I was surprised by how looking back on it, surprised how many games that Viney missed, surprised how many games um, Arms missed. But when you, when you look at the core of players, it was a pretty blessed run. And even when you look at things that were at the time, absolute disasters. So we've got our, our two tools in Wiedemann and Brown getting injured in the preseason, which actually threw our entire forward line into chaos. But that gives the opportunity for Tom McDonald, who was trade bait from the year before. And yep. he stepped up and off the top of my head, I think he played every game last year. So... Look, obviously, injuries going into the season. We've had a pretty good run, again, touch wood, over the preseason this year. Injuries, and look, we won't really know until probably a few minutes into round one how bad they want it. And I think one of the things that, that I'm excited about for the year is, is, is seeing crowds at the footy again. Oh, yeah. Um, and when I consider, if I put myself into the player's position, most of the people who took the field that day they, they didn't have their parents in the ground. They didn't have their, their spouse or their partner at the ground either. Like there were very few people who were actually there on the day to actually appreciate what they'd done. So if, if, I, was, if I was one of the players, that would be something that would be driving me, that this yeah. is something that I want to share with my kids, something I want to share with my partner, share with my parents on the day. So look, we'll know pretty early in the year. I think if the hunger is is still there, and we probably won't know that till the real stuff starts. Um, I, I watched the first little practice match against Carlton, oh not Carlton, North Melbourne the other week. I don't know if you had a chance to watch that. Yeah, yeah, I, did. I think they won by eighty eight points. You could yeah. just see from when they rolled out, it was it was men playing boys, mm. but everything that we saw last year, you could see that there was no different. It was just pinpoint accuracy in the kicking, um, selflessness. I don't think that there's going to be any premiership hangover with this group. I don't think, I don't think Goodwin, I don't think Gorn, I don't think uh, Choco Williams will allow a premiership hangover at all. I just think that there's, there's too much for this club to work to just drop off after one year. They've seen clubs do that. They don't want to be a Western Bull. They don't want to be a, a West Coast Eagle. They want to have mm. sustained success because, you know, the simple thing is, is that, you know, it's better than being, you know, it's better than being a premiership player. Two-time premiership player. And, and I suppose we, we look at, at the helm is two-time premiership player Simon Goodwin. So, I mean, he's been in this position before. He's, he's been – he wasn't a leader at the club when it happened. It was really early in his career at Adelaide when they won in 97 and 98. But he's been in an environment that has enjoyed sustained success. And, and similar to Uze in his coaching career as well, coming over from Hawthorne. Like they, they know what it takes um, to be there. And something I, something I did like – about the um, the match against North Melbourne as well is though we were premiers playing the the wooden spooners from the year before, we still basically had our strongest twenty two take the field with without with probably only Fritch Lever and Viney missing the match. Like we played a strong team, 
um, which means the coaches want to, want them to be out there, the players want to be out there. Everyone's competing for a place in yep. the team, and that's that's a pretty solid environment to be going to. Yeah, and you know what it is like. What what really excites me moving into this year? It's you know what you're going to get from certain people. Okay, Clayton Oliver, you know what you're going to get. Right, yep. Gorney, you know what you're going to get. Petrarca, you now know what you're going to get. And it wasn't he was he was he was good, but he just he's he's good. He's a bull, and he's more consistent now. Like remember how he was a little bit. Mm, mm, now he knows. Oh, he was what a he long way to. off. Yeah. yeah, before and now prior he's just twenty twenty one. He was a long way off. He's fit. Like he's he's unbelievable. Genuinely, he's looking mean. All right, Stephen May, you know what you're going to get. Jake Lever, you know what you're going to get. And you know, you look back now, and yes, Melbourne, you'd think they gave up too much for him. He's another captain out there. Like you just see the way that he organizes yeah. that backline group is amazing. Christian Salem, you know, they always go on about, oh, him versus Kelly. Why would you go? Well, hold on a second. If I had to line both of them up right now, yeah, Josh Kelly is a good player. He's actually probably he's definitely one. I'd take Salem any day of the week now because he's, you look at that grand final, he was BOG up until quarter time. Yeah. I think also, like when you talk about the Kelly trade, you, you need to add, Dom Tyson, who, yep. like, you know, we, we got, we absolutely had to have someone like him. But you've also got to add Jaden Hunt. The pick that we used on Jaden Hunt was to yep. that as well. So, look, Kelly's, Kelly's awesome. He's very welcome oh, to we join us take anytime him. he wants. But um, at the time, but, we needed. And now we've got, um, we've got Salem and, and Tyson. We've got, for the majority of last year, they're our two halfbacks. And, and then we you got have them for the price of, yeah, Josh Kelly. And then you've got, but then you look at people and then you get Fritchie comes out and kicks 58, I think, for the season. Like, yeah. no one saw that coming. Is he going to be able to do it again? I think he can. And I think he can. He, maybe not as many, but he'll be kicking over 40 because it's okay. You've got to, you've got to look at it as a collective. If you're a backline coming against Melbourne this year, all right, you're walking down. You're with your six buddies and you're looking down who you're going to take. First of all, you've got... Krusty the Clown down there in terms of mm-hmm. Ben Brown, who looks fitter than he ever has. He looks good. He looks really right. good. Yeah. Tom McDonald looks fitter than he does. He had his back issues. You remember when his season went downhill to a degree once his back started playing up yeah, towards the end yeah, of I last think, year? Yeah, I would think so too, yeah. He looks like he's back. All right, so you got those two. Your third stringer has to take a guy who's kicked 56, all right? Then on top of that, your fourth stringer has to go and play on Cozzy Pickett. Your fifth stringer has to then go and take uh, the tackling serial pest in Charlie Park, Spargo. And then you've got this other guy who, who's, who's the sixth option who is going to be kicked out by the club at the end of 2020 in terms of A and B, who had his, like, in, he just almost took it to another. So you've got six yeah. viable options. Then you have to worry, will Petrarca get it? Go and float down. Will Jackson take a mark? Lukey Jackson might be around. Exactly. Oliver, Oliver can kick a goal. Like his game against Adelaide, the one that we lost, was one of the greatest single Melbourne games ever played. Yep. Like there's just there's just options galore. And that's where I see us over someone like a Western Bull. Because Norton's not their main Norton's their main man, but that's it. Uh Jamara isn't at the spot yet. Darcy's injured. Bruce is not going to be back for a while. So all this pressure is on uh Norton. Where are they going to get their goals from? Brisbane are in a bit of a different perspective. Yeah, I think they've got I, more options up front. I think Brisbane, when you when you look at Brisbane, it's I mean, Brisbane has a better spread of talent than Western Bulldogs. I think yep. the I think the top talent at Western Bulldogs probably trumps the top talent at um, yep. at, at the Bullies. Bullies is a really uneven list, I think. And I think they've got some firepower forward. They've got some undeniable firepower in the midfield. It's unbelievable. But they are really vulnerable down back. Um, and if you can over, and I think we we had we had a trilogy of matches against them last year and came out two one, and the the one we lost is when we allowed their midfield to to get on top of us. Yeah, we didn't we didn't play that flash that night at all. That's no, it wasn't. Again, it wasn't, I, but it was, I, wet, it was yucky. It just yeah, it wasn't. A it was empty game. as well. It was an empty stadium. Like yeah, but doggies which, would have played in many empty stadiums over the years, so they would have been yeah. used to it. And, and we should have been used to it as well. <laughs> exactly. But like Petra, Petrarca and, and Oliver and, 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 and Pickett and like these, these young guys, that they, they feed off that. And, and watching them play, even in hostile crowds, they feed off that energy. They, they love it. 
Um, and I, I think they probably struggled a little bit in some of those empty stadiums um, when they weren't able to generate that, that kind of energy. But I think Brisbane, what, what we've seen from Brisbane is they've got a great list, but when it comes time for finals, they haven't quite got in that headspace where they can bring their best football. If they can do that, then I think they're a genuine, they're a genuine threat going and into then, next year. So. Oh, that, de- definitely. My, and if, like I said, if Hipwood and Danaher can fire and they can kick 100 between them for the year, they're going to be in a really dangerous spot come September. And Charlie Cameron, look, Charlie Cameron was well, terrified right. me that entire final. He was, if anyone was going to put on a show and, and take that away from us, it was, it was Charlie Cameron. That he night. only kicked five that night. So it he, happened. He, could have, he was oh, looking like he, 10. He was About calm, halfway he? through that first quarter, he's, he's, he's a footballer. And I think Joel Smith was like, um, right up. Yeah. Please. I don't like talking, I don't like talking down about Melbourne players. Um, but I think Joel Smith sort of got, got, a, got a bit of a lesson that day yeah. in what it takes to be, how to play on a player who just is a real footballer. And I think Charlie Cameron, is is an athlete. He's got unbelievable pace. He's fit, but he's just got this football brain, and he just he just knows before it happens. He's kind of like Jake Lever. He's Jake Lever knows exactly what's going to happen before it happens. And then Charlie the Cameron ones too. is exactly he, Charlie Cameron. He only needs was, to be around the vicinity, and anything can happen. And there was one stoppage. It would have been, it the would have been just like, oh it would have been just on just on Brisbane's side of centre wing, and there was yep. a stoppage there, and it was 50-50 ball, and. Cameron took off. He knew exactly what was about to unfold. And then it went one, two, straight into his lap. Smith was left watching I the stoppage that one. It was 20 going metres to the left away. Yep, exactly. He was watching the stoppage, as, as I guess you would, <laughs> wondering what was going to happen next. And Cameron knew. And, and he took well, off. I think that was when his third for the quarter. That, and I went, oh, no, here we go. When again. you come up against a player like that, it's like, I suppose, if you're really just talking about how do we gate this, you, you can't stop. Yep. And, you know, it, it's, it is going to be a challenge, but then I just look at names and names that no other club and even to us to a degree didn't even pick. Like we knew Petty could play, right? Yeah. What he did after Tom Lumsden went down was extraordinary. He, his final series was – and he just he was someone who just, just got better. He's Almost his confidence in himself is sensational. James Jordan, I don't care. He didn't get on the park. He's still a premiership player because mm. he played – 20, he played every game last year. And there were some of those times where he stood up and made a difference to us as well too. So you know, that's just yeah. the way it works. Tom Sparrow, you could sort of see it, broke out last year as well. So some of these names that you sort of sit back and go, oh, I'm not too – they're going to get even, I, in my opinion, will even get better. So it just makes it harder for spots. So you've got guys clamoring to get in there, guys who are already in there, can I ask yeah. you about and Luke Jackson? Yeah, you can ask anything you I want about, about Luke Jackson. Jackson. Yeah. What would you like to know? I don't know. Just tell me. <laughs> just tell me what we don't know. Just tell me what you don't already know. Is this guy, is he special? Are we lucky to have this guy with us? I was thinking about, I was thinking about Luke Jackson yesterday, actually. You know, as you do when you're walking down the street and you've got nothing else to think about. I normally dream I about him. To, I just decided to think about Luke Jackson. And yep. I, I was thinking this idea of, um, of second year blues, and I know he's going into his third year, but I think if we if we count last year as his absolute breakout year, and he, he's backing it up, and I think probably what he has, which other players don't, is this ability. If one thing isn't working for him, then the coach and he can try something else. If he's not clunking him in the forward line, then they can move him into the ruck. If it's not happening for him in the ruck, then he's more than he's he's easily fast enough and fit enough be playing on a flank or even playing on ball or even sitting out on a wing. Check him on a so wing? No matter, no matter what is happening with him, there, there are other options there. So as far as him coming in, there'll be a lot of attention on him this year. There'll be a lot oh, of, no I doubt. suppose, media pressure on him as well. If he does fall into that trap of, of, of feeling some of that pressure, there's so many strings to his bows. And it's, it's kind of similar to Cozzy Pickett. Because Cozzy Pickett, I, again, I didn't realise at the end of the year just how good he was for the first half of the year. He was he was nothing short of incredible, and probably was sitting was penciled in for an all Australian position. Probably halfway through line. the season, he he was there, and then just sort of yeah, second but year even, caught yeah, up a bit as as he would. But even even with that, his his one percenters and his his willingness to chase and his willingness to put pressure on it, it didn't drop for a second, and and that kept him in the team. He wasn't being kept in the team 
you know, as any personal favour from from Simon Goodwin. He was he never stopped running, and he, he was he's got an incredible tank and an incredible desire to influence a contest. And I think we looked at we look at Alex Neil Bullen, Charlie Spargo, and Cosy Pickett oh. as, as those three. They and, are the holy trinity. Well, yeah, and what I it seems them. to me is for Melbourne to be at our best, we need at least two out of the three to be playing well. Yep. If three out of three play well, then that's absolutely fantastic. We're going to be a very, very good team. If two play, we are, we are very, very good. I think in the teams where in the matches where we dropped off a little bit, it was when only one of them were, was yep. able to have an influence on it. And I think Alex Neil Bullen's season last year, I'm, I'm really excited to see what he can produce this year because I, I don't think he's going to be a star of the game, but, geez, he's turned into a good player. A really I think good he player. was almost number one or two for tackles in the inside 50. Last yep. year, he, a lot of time, you know, my, my old man is probably the biggest Neil Bullen um, tractor, and even yep. he said, like, I have to sort of take take it, bite the bitter pull, bitter pill because of what happened there. But that, yeah, was, well, that was one of the knocks on him going into the season because people would sort of say, oh, you know, you've got to do more than tackling, and well, he absolutely did. Last year, his his the efficiency of his disposal into in, inside fifty, the the creativity him and Spargo, the creativity they have with the ball, just the ability to stop and and not rush and and look for an option, because again, you, you think small forward, you think tackles and goals, but I think what Spargo and Neil Bullen do so well is they are team oriented players. They, their yep. football is first and athletes second, and they always consider a, a better placed option. And they just keep getting a contest. You have a look at uh, the last game of the year, that fight back that we got in the last quarter, the first two out of the three goals yeah. I think came from Spargo. One of them yeah. one of them was a toe poke across the line which looked like it was going to go in. And yeah. then another one was a classic front and centre that a forward pocket should be doing. And then you have a look in the grand final where Petrarca kicks his little dribbler across the line. What people don't actually go back and watch the vision, have a look at the shepherd that uh, Pickett puts on. Cozzy. Yep. Absolutely. Puts on Dunkley. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the little things that Melbourne never used to do. Yeah. They're playing for each other. And a team that plays for each other plays for their coach. They're a very dangerous. They're very, very dangerous as well, too. Um, all righty. Look, I, we could just sit here and talk about I know, who this I know. team is going to be <laughs> all night. But I have to go through a few things. So um, yeah. who do you think is going to be a breakout star for the Ds this year? Because um, – we had many of them last year, but is there somebody that you've seen or heard about that probably going to sneak a spot in that maybe at the end of the year we're going to go, geez, I'll tell you what, good old Peter Moylan, he was in a different yep. country and he saw it before exactly. I did. And I'm Safe only down money. the road. I think, um, look, if, if you're playing fantasy football or something like that, I think smart money goes on to Tom Sparrow. Yep. And I think he's, show, he's just shown his ability over the last couple of years to, to be – He's a physical player. He likes the contest. Yes, he's a competitor. He, does. he also has this, and he's shown this since um, since 2020. He just he's just in the he's one of those players who, when he's not playing in his preferred position, and he, he's not, when, but even when he's not, he has the ability to be where the ball is. On top of that, I think he's he's noticeably bulked up over the preseason. He's not to use the cliche training the house down. He got a lot of midfield time uh, against North Melbourne. So I'm expecting Tom Sparrow to have a really, really good year. And he came out of the, the grand final last year. Um, he set up Fritch. That was going through for a goal in the first quarter when Fritchie put, took it on his chest. Yep. Um, he was part of the, the blitz um, at the end of the oh, third the, quarter the as well. The blitz gone in Just 60 the, seconds. Exactly. The, the turn, and, turn and deliver a, from 55 a, out. He's got – his hands mm. are amazing. I remember when he started, someone said he's very danger field like the way that he plays. Yeah. And I'm starting to see that a little bit. He's got he's great got a good, hands. He's got, he's got a good, got good build for it. He's got good hands. Yeah. He's, and he, he wants he wants it. He's, he's a competitor. Um, yeah. And he fought his way into the team because I think what he had um, 21 games, according to the stats, he had 21 games for 2021, but he only actually took the field for 15 of them. So – when you've got a young player who's spending a lot of time on the pine just watching these games, he's not getting a run in the VFL and he's able to then, through, just through his training standards, seemingly alone, force his way back into the team. You, you wonder what he's doing on the track because he must be an animal to, to oh, persuade a, the, 
to the persuade best. the coaches to to let me in. I'm I'm a best. I'm not a top twenty three player. I'm a best twenty two. Let me in. So I reckon. My money's I reckon if I had a duffel coat right now, I would almost throw the number thirty two on the back of it. It'd be number six because that's what I wore playing footy. Good old Lukey Jackson. But I reckon thirty two. I just love the way he carries himself. All righty. Unfortunately, um, somebody at the end of the year is going to get the tap on the shoulder from Goody um, to say, "Look, mate, we're going to have to have to finish you up in your future endeavors." Who's going to be the breakdown? Jeez, twenty. It, it has to happen, and it doesn't have to be a bad breakdown. It might be something yeah. like you know what your time's up. You've been awesome. That is tough. <laughs> well, I know it's, it's tough, but yeah, man, that it is has really to happen because tough. you've got to have three draft picks minimum. Yeah, I think something, and that, that's something that we've lost as well. I think over the last couple of years, in not being able to see VFL matches, where yeah. the players have lost something in their, in their development. I think we've lost something of the excitement of, of young players coming through. Of hearing about like, someone. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, look at Bailey, Bailey Laurie and, and Fraser Rossman, like players like that who we drafted in a couple of years ago who we actually haven't really had a chance to get a look at um, and getting a tap. Look, I I think I would have tapped um, Hibbert on the yep. shoulder two years ago. Uh, and I was, again, I don't like criticising Melbourne players, but, I I was I thought he was he was cooked two years ago and he proved yeah. me he made me look a fool in the second half of last year. But oh, if we're just looking at age profile, yep. yeah. If we're just looking at age profile, look, maybe someone like Hibbert is is getting you know close. Well, he's obviously much closer to the end than he was the start. Um, as far as players getting forced out of the twenty two, um, I'm really curious to see which Tom McDonald turns up this year. And I know he's changed a lot. In his preparation, yeah. Um, but I think coming off the, a lot of people say how good he was in in 2018. He was also exceptional in the second half of 17. I think he got injured halfway through 17 and then came back in as a key forward. Played fantastically well. Switched to key forward full time in 2018. Had an unbelievable season, and then just completely dropped off the face of the earth in 1920. Really. Yeah, um, and then really stood up and played exceptionally well last year. So. I, I really want to see which Tom McDonald turns up because I'm a huge fan of Wiedemann. Um, I think Benny Brown is looking very, very imposing. So I, I'd be curious to see where Tom McDonald is sitting compared to Wiedemann because I think those two are probably in direct competition with each other. And I think they'll go with McDonald first. Yeah. He's got the runs on the board. And just from the way he played, it'll be interesting when he plays against Carlton in that game to sort of see what happens because both of them are going to be playing. Yeah. How, they, how they take that out as well too, so who they decide to go with. But, and that's, that's um, Goodwin's approach too, I think, because uh, I, I, he's, if you're going to be really cutthroat about it, I think if we didn't lose, we won, what was it, five, we won six games on the truck at the end of the year, including, yeah. including finals. You've got to wonder if we had dropped any of them, if Tom McDonald would have survived. Because Goodwin is loath to make changes and he's definitely loath to make changes to a winning team. I think usually for... Going from, um, our, our, especially during the finals and then the few games leading into the finals, the only changes we made were because of injury. None of them were for form. But I'm not sure. He couldn't really change form. anybody for form because exactly. there was no games. So it was almost a blessing in disguise to a, Yeah. To a so Tom McDonald might, like, there are no lucky players in a premiership no. team, but he was probably fortunate that I don't think it would have been even up for discussion because we were winning and Goodwin didn't want to change that. So if I, had to, if I had to throw my hat in the ring in terms of a breakdown in terms of who might be their last season, I don't know what his contract status is, but Jake Melksham sort yeah. of hasn't been – he's been off the ball for the last couple of years. It's not the same Jake Melksham. He played okay against Hawthorne last year, but outside of that, he didn't – hasn't done much probably for the last two. Yep. Now, whether that's injury, whether it's just lack of form, not being able to get games – He's going to have to do something special because, you know, Thomas Barrow has literally taken his spot. Charlie Spargo has virtually taken his spot. Cozzy has virtually taken his spot. And when yeah. you had a guy running around at the age of 30, going to be 31 towards the end of the season, yeah. you know, kids who are 20, 21, 22 running around, you can do the same thing but probably a lot faster and be a little bit more nimble. Yeah. It's going to be hard for him to, 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 to slot back in. The other one that I could see in terms of a breakout, 
and he might play a game this year, and it might be one of those ones towards the end of the season, and it might be against a lower club, but I reckon Jacob Van Roo will play a senior game by the end of the year. I reckon they'll get to a point where they'll go, okay, maybe we will, we will rest a McDonald. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll rest a, a Petty or a Tomlinson. We might have him off the bench, but I reckon just from what I've seen, a guy that big, you can't, you can't hide them too much. He's, he's been doing some pretty special things, yeah. I think, down the training. Um, I think some of the highlights you see from, from training and some of the training reports that you, you read, he's, yep. he's doing some pretty special things. And Goodwin doesn't mind playing those special ones either. Yeah. Loves the special one. All righty. So <laughs> we're going to open up the Herald Sun at the end of the season, mm-hmm. or in your case, the Hong Kong Times. All right. There's a headline on the back of the Herald Sun or the paper over there in Hong Kong. What will the headline be to summarise the 2022 season for the Demons this year? I can't believe they beat the Western Bulldogs by even more. Oh. <laughs> doesn't. It doesn't rhyme. It's not It doesn't catchy. matter. It doesn't matter. It's, I can't believe uh, it. I've got to ask you before I get into like the overall, this whole rivalry, have you heard anything if it's legit, if it's all being made up? What have you heard on the Twitter sphere with your contacts with the Bulldogs? Like, seriously, uh, over a song, yeah. it can't that, be. I mean, that's, it can't be, really, can it? It's, it's almost like childish, if, that, if that's true. And it's, it's clickbait. It'd have to be clickbait. Exactly. You've know? got nothing better said, to write about. At the same time, there'd be something wrong if there wasn't a rock. You'd be worried about that. If team absolutely, well, to put it harshly, like humiliates you in a grand final. And it's going to be interesting to see how Western Bulldogs respond because I, I think people are sort of expecting it's going to be business as usual for the bullies coming into this year. But when you look at teams that get that sort of a beating in a grand final, it's not often they come back so quickly from it. I think if we look at GWS after Richmond did an absolute number on them um, Adelaide. In, in 2019, Adelaide in 2017, it, it, they weren't gallant in defeat. They they got absolutely pantsed. And Hawthorne did it with West Coast, teams, Fremantle. Like these they teams. struggle to come back, and 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 that makes sense. And I haven't heard any talk of that for the for the Bulldogs this year. There's an expectation that they're going to come in and be the same team they were last year. So I would be I would find it really strange if they, as competitors, didn't take their defeat personally. I would find it really strange if they didn't want to get revenge. So, look, there has to be a rivalry there, but I'm not sure it's about a song. I'd be disappointed for them if it was about a song. Hopefully it's about what we did to them oh, I think uh, in that the grand would final. A little bit more. The interesting thing I reckon in that first game of the year, if Melbourne get off to a, a blinder, let's just say two or three goals up really quickly, mm-hmm. if they'll go, oh, my God, it's happening again. Exactly. And that's, that's- the, the mental scars. Exactly right. And if it's, if it's like bang, 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 like it happened last year, all righty. All right, Peter, it's time to put the agates on the chopping block right now because we are now going to look at this from a league perspective. All right. Who yes. have you got? And you can tip your own team. There's no rules against it. Who have you got down for the Premiers in 2022? This is boring, but I have got Melbourne as, as going back to back. If, yep. if something goes horribly wrong, um, yep. then it's Brisbane. Well, I will let you know, sir, that that has pretty much been the consensus across the board. There was one person who picked GWS. Ooh. Yep. Um, I I can't believe they even did it, but you've got to. I've got to respect everybody who comes on the my yeah. show. Uh, but yes, there was one pick, person who picked GWS to come back and bounce back. Coleman yeah. medalist. Who have you got down? Who's going to be kicking the most in the league for the season? Look, I, I, up until I heard that he's got a, got a bit of a foot issue, I, I had Harry Mackay. I really rate Harry Mackay. I, I've good, heard he's got a bit of a foot issue. Yes, he um, he's not going to be. scares me. Um, as a, obviously, again, as a Melbourne supporter, we've seen our fair share of, um, <laughs> of foot, foot injuries. Issue. So I'm actually going to go for Tom Lynch from Richmond Oof. to bounce back. I think he had a really off year. Um, I rate him as a player. And, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and get yeah, Tom Lynch. Very nice. Come up a couple of times. Um, the dynamic duo out of Geelong have usually been the picks. But yep. I like where you're going there. Now, Brownlow medal, and another question on top of that, has the Brownlow medal lost a bit of its luster towards the MVP slash coaches award that's offered? For me, 
Yep. Yes. Well, look, it's 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 never gonna. I don't think it'll ever lose its prestige. I think if you ask someone who, I think if you ask someone who's not a footy freak who won the AFL Coaches Award last year, they're not going to know. There's a chance they'll know who won the Brownlow. Yeah, no, no, exactly. So, <laughs> but there's a good chance that well, I just had to write it down as part of the prep. <laughs> but look, I, for me, I look at the coaches' votes when I when yep. I'm reviewing a match. I, I look at the coaches' votes, and it's far more aligned, I think, with with I, what I see out there. Yep. It's almost to the point where it's unfair to ask the umpires on top of everything else that they have to do yep. to also pick out a three, two, one. Exactly right, and they they've got their eyes on what's happening. In the vicinity, they're not looking up the other ends of the ground. What's the backman doing? What's the forwards doing? How are they? They're also, they're also not big picture. They're also not like sort of looking like, hang on, you kept Tom Hawkins to zero goals and also to four intercept marks. Like they're not thinking big picture about a match. And, a, and they impact. just see so, four kicks, four marks. That's yeah, it. they just they just see the guy in front of them keeps getting the ball and they go, well, that's a good match. Is that and, those stats are from champion data, aren't they? Which one's that, sorry? The stats that they get. Day in uh, at the games. I think they're done by Champion Data, the same mob that rated Nick Natanui the number one player in the league. I think I think, uh, I think Max Gorn wasn't even a link to. <laughs> He's not. Uh, to them. <laughs> That's what made people no. laugh. They're like seriously. There some, yeah, there was some yeah. shockers in this year. So who have you got for uh, taking Charlie home? And we're not talking Spargo. <laughs> we're talking. Look, are we, <laughs> Mrs. Spargo? Um, are we? Are you allowed to have a tie? Or is that just you have as many as you fans? want? No, no one's picked a tie yet. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Bont and Pally as the safe pick, but I, yeah. I'm going to say Lockie Neal's going to come back in because I, I think he was really hampered last year by I think a back injury, and yep. I'm predicting him to step right up in a team in Brisbane that I see featuring pretty pretty well the next pretty year. So times. I'll go the tie. Sensational, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you what, if this hasn't been the best Melbourne. Demons 2020 season preview, you're, you're going to get, well, then don't listen to anybody else. Forget AFL 360. Don't worry about the nuffies on the couch. You've got, you've got Peter and Peps talking about the single greatest football club ever. Now, tell us, with your podcast, Radio, yeah. what's going to happen with the D's Watch podcast? You're going to get through all the 2021 games. Are you then rolling into 2022? What, what are the plans for this season? I think it, when you ask us, we, we, we talk about this almost every week and I, I think uh, it's, it, it's been hard work getting through all the matches and I think usually before the podcast, we think, oh, no, no, it's too hard, we don't have the time to do it. You get to the end of it and you, know, you, get, you get pretty excited about talking footy with your mates. So at this stage, it looks like we might keep it rolling in some way, shape or form for the season. Work. Awesome. Um, and look, that's pending approval from our, from our partners. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> I know where I you're think, coming from. I know she where was really enthusiastic from. about it at the start. She's going, it's a great idea. You can meet up with your friends every week and have a chat. And I was going, okay, good, I'll do it. And now it's pretty much, are you done? Until, are you you done re- until she realised this wasn't the COVID season where there was 17, yeah. there's 25 of them. So, yeah, so totally look, understandable. Pen- pending approval. Uh, I think we'll be look, kicking on. I think we're all approved. You have been absolutely sensational tonight. So, Ladies and gents, there is your season preview for the D's. Look, I, I must admit, I am a little bit biased. I think that we are going to go back to back. I've actually picked us to go a four, Pete. I'm not going to lie. <sighs> unless we get Mason Coxed like Richmond. But <laughs> on top of that, the last thing I have, I have one question and one question just to finish off this amazing chat that I've had with you. Peter Molan from the D's Watch Podcast. How do you want your footy? I want it lace out. There you go, gents. There you go, ladies. Have a great evening. We're going to have something special. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Lace Out. Head over to iTunes and Spotify to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. And remember, join us every single Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, on our Facebook page with yours truly, Christopher Pepper, and the co-host with the most, Jamie Wallace, giving you your footy how you want it, Ice out.